Liftoff will start in T minus 10 seconds. What's up, everybody? This is Evan and John, and you're listening to the Boomer and X Show. What's up? Welcome, everybody. Go ahead, Evan. What's up? <laughs> Welcome everybody to the Boomer and X show. We have a very, very special show for you today. We have a very special guest. Matt Steele is uh, with us today. He is an immigration law expert. Matt, welcome to the show. Hey, everybody. Uh, please tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay, so like you said, my name is Matthew Steele. I am a recent law graduate from Loyola University of New Orleans. I have several years of experience in immigration nationally, nationality law, although I wouldn't consider myself in any stretch an expert. But I, I have represented people through the Loyola Law Clinic uh, under the supervision of clinic professor Hiroko Kasuda. And I, I have worked in several support roles with several area law firms. Uh, I do have some experience with removal proceedings. I have experience with naturalization and certificate of citizenship cases, affirmative immigrant and non-immigrant visa cases, primarily focused on family-based permanent residents, also affirmative asylum visas for those who have been victim of a crime or human trafficking, some diplomat visas, fiance visas, special immigrant juvenile visas, treaty investor visas, and more. Knowing that I wanted to practice in that area from the start of law school, I spent a lot of time and I excelled in immigration nationality law courses. I achieved certificates in social justice as well as immigration and citizenship law and practice. I was awarded the Gillis Long Poverty Law Center Public Service Award in 2014, and I served as the research assistant to Maria Pabon, who is, was the dean of the College of Law. Also in law school, I served as the American Immigration Lawyers Association student liaison for two consecutive years. I am a lifelong resident of the West Bank in Jefferson Parish, Louisiana. I'm an alum of, as I said, Loyola University of New Orleans College of Law, also the University of New Orleans and Archbishop Shaw High School in Barrero, Louisiana. Today, I'm an active member of the Shaw Alumni Association and I'm on the school's advisory board. Also, I'm a husband and a father of two girls and a baby boy. Evan and I have been friends for several years now, and I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you guys today. Uh, ethically, I feel the need to emphasize that I'm not licensed by any U.S. jurisdiction at this time, and I'm unable to give any legal advice. And uh, nothing I'd say today would, should be understood to be giving legal advice. And, and if the listeners who are in need of any kind of immigration legal advice, I would recommend contacting a licensed attorney, preferably one who is an active member of the American Immigration Lawyers Association in good standing. Matt, what first got you interested in this line of work? So as uh, Evan is pretty familiar with, we met at Northwestern State University in 2007. I was a music student, specifically a music education student. He and I are drummers, percussionists. Uh, I thought that I was going to be a band director. This wasn't anything that I had thought of for myself at that time. My dad was is, is and was a lawyer, and I think I had kind of the legal profession in a, in a box in, in my mind that, you know, I love and respect my dad and, and, and his work, but I, didn't, I wasn't interested in doing car accident cases mm -hmm. and that kind of thing, some of the stuff that my dad primarily does. So that's what I kind of had in my mind. That's what a lawyer does. I, uh, I had some things uh, happen in my life, and I ended up back where I'm originally from, which is the New Orleans area. I finished up my bachelor's degree at UNO, and during that time, I took a few courses, and I really reflected on, you know, is music really the path I want to take? I prayed, and I reflected on it a lot, and I took a course on uh, immigration policy given by Professor Rosenberg at UNO. And it really kind of opened my eyes to the legal profession in a different way than what I was familiar with. And immigration and migration and uh, its evolution over the past few hundred years and policy and all these interesting things. And uh, as a Catholic, it was particularly uh, attractive because the Catholic Church is so vocal in support of the migrant, you know, the foreigner, as, it, as it's referred to in Exodus and other parts of the Bible. It became a really attractive thing for me. So I finished 
UNO with an interdisciplinary studies degree, which is kind of a glorified general studies degree, knowing that I just want to be able to take as many courses as I can that I know I'm going to do well at to build up my GPA and get myself into law school so I can do this thing. When I got to law school, I essentially stalked Professor Hiroko Kasuda that I referred to earlier, mm-hmm. and uh, she she's the head of the clinical program at, at Loyola, and uh, you know I begged her to let me volunteer on some stuff. And instead of letting me get her coffee, she put me right onto the front lines. And I was representing non-immigrants in immigration court as a first year law student because they have a program where law students are given special permission to represent people free of charge who are in need of legal help. So it's win-win. I was able to get experience before I even graduated law school and people were able to be represented who otherwise could not afford a lawyer. That's kind of how I got to that point. Of course, immigration has been a topic, a political topic, certainly, for years. It was a very hot topic during the 26th presidential campaign. It now, it, you know, it was right? really brought to the forefront by the Republican candidate and now President Donald Trump with a lot of talk of deportation of illegals and building of walls and, 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 and kind of trying to relate it all to, to national security. And as Evan and I have have talked among ourselves for quite some time, and and we were, we wanted to have you on even before we went on our unexpected six month hiatus. We, um, uh, you know, er, a lot of people have an opinion about immigration, but very few people know much about it. So the reason we want to have you on today is to, uh, is so we'll have some basis going forward for forming some of our opinions and 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 because it, having an informed opinion is always better than just having an opinion based on previous biases or prejudices so that's what we're looking for today some um some education from you sure and in the news you know journalists do a, as good a job as they can their expertise is in journalism not in all the various things that, that they talk about or that they write about. So people, unfortunately, have a limited understanding of things. You can't be an expert or, or well-versed in every single thing. So it's not nothing to be ashamed of, but hopefully I can give some insight on this area that I have a little bit of experience with today. Well, let's start with just a, a basic. I mean, terms like illegal immigration and legal immigration or documented workers or undocumented workers get thrown around a lot. Can we kind of just start by maybe going with what do those terms actually mean and who might fall into those categories, even if those categories even actually have relevance in in those words specifically. Okay. So uh, as you pointed out, there's, depending on what your, maybe a person's political persuasion might be, they may choose to use different terms. Uh, I gravitate towards undocumented because it's understood to be kind of the the less intense and the the less defensive term. Mm -hmm. But essentially at the end of the day, legal versus illegal, it's not always a black and white thing. It's it's actually very gray. For example, somebody who might initially come to the United States on some kind of visa, we'll say a student or a tourist visa may overstay, putting them in unlawful status. Uh, And the converse of that is also true where somebody may cross the border or take a flight here The the legal term is without inspection, but that person is eligible for certain types of relief. So arguably, people might say that that person is undocumented or illegal, but arguably that person is not because they enter the country with that type of relief available to them. So it really isn't a cut or dry kind of thing. What what provides that type of relief? Okay, so for example, the United States is a party to the Refugee Convention, it's a party to the Convention Against Torture through the UN. And because of that, we have an obligation to protect certain persons who are from a particular country and for whatever reason is unable or unwilling to avail themselves of the protection of that country and are persecuted under specified bases. And the government is typically either the perpetrator of the persecution or they turn a blind eye or they just simply don't have the resources to protect that person. So pursuant to our treaty obligations and now our our laws and regulations, we have an obligation to at least allow that person to make their case before an asylum officer or before an immigration court that they're eligible for 
uh, it, it's called asylum. You often hear political asylum, but it doesn't necessarily need to hinge off of politics. It can be off of other bases, but it's, it's referred to as asylum. You mentioned student visas and travel visas, right? Tourists, yeah. Tourists, yeah, tourist visas. Oh, how long are they usually valid for? So when a person enters the United States, uh, they're either issued typically what's called an I-94 card or an I-94W. And what that says on it is that this person is eligible to stay in this country until this date, depending on what it is. As far as a student, typically what you'll see written on these cards, which are digital now, but you'll see on them D slash S, which Mm -hmm. stands for duration of status which in very plain terms means if I come here as a student, as long as I'm still in that program or I, I stay a student, as long as I'm a student, I'm good. You also asked about tourist visa. A lot of times a tourist visa, it'll say on the I-94 card a specified day that you got to get out. And that is something that is determined by typically CBP, Border Patrol, when the person comes in. So that's, that's a common misconception too, is that there's a difference between visa validity, time validity, and what your actual stay is valid for. Sometimes people think, well, my visa is valid from this state to this state, so I must be okay to stay. Mm-hmm. Uh, what, what the visa says doesn't really matter. What matters is what the immigration official at the border or at the airport puts on this particular card that I'm referring to. They'll ask them some questions, and based on that, they'll say, essentially what a visa does is, is ask permission to enter. But aside from that, it doesn't do anything. It's the the I-94 card that tells a person, this is how long you can stay. And what's the means of keeping track of these people once once they're in the country? So immigration is kind of overseen by several federal agencies. It Mm -hmm. includes the Department of State, the Department of Homeland Security, in some ways, Health and Human Services, the Department of Labor, uh, the FBI, national security agencies. They somewhat work together and, and they keep track of people who are entering and leaving. A person who is here is supposed to, for example, let the government know every time that they change addresses and that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Now, it, to an extent, it is kind of an honor system. People can go years and may have several addresses and never do that. So, I mean, there, there maybe is an argument that it could be strengthened a little bit or more centralized or that the agencies could do some more information sharing and do a better job. So if someone fails to alert the government of of a of a change, are are they then in, in in some sort of criminal state just by failure to do so? Uh, I would say typically not a criminal state, uh, and that's a really good point to bring up is that immigration violations for the most part are not crimes; they are civil offenses related to perhaps thinking in terms of maybe a traffic ticket. It's not a crime in a, in a legal sense. If it was, what that would do would be if staying, overstaying your visa or coming in unlawfully uh, without permission was a crime, that would mean that a, an individual in that situation would, be, would have available to him or her all of the constitutional protections of a criminal defendant, which would include the fact that the government would have to provide at its own expense a public defender to represent that person. So I think it, it's worth noting that overstaying your visa it's not really a crime. It's a, it's a violation. I see. It certainly isn't a felonious event. Correct. That's okay. a good way to put it. A couple of different types of visas that I wanted to ask you about. T visas and U visas. What what can, circumstances are they used in? What purposes do they serve for okay, protection so, for the holder of that visa? So uh, T and U visas are very related. In a way, they're cousins. A lot of the same criteria is the same for both. Specifically, what a U visa is intended for is that persons who are the victim of certain crimes in the United States, it's an incentive to reach out to law enforcement and call the police when they're being a victim of such crimes without the fear of, if I do that, I will be put in immigration detention myself and sent back home. And what it does is it provides an avenue for those persons to get legalized status. They have to do certain things such as they have to cooperate with the police. They, they have to testify. They serve as a witness. They have to work with the prosecution as good as they can, or they have to show that they were willing to do so. The law enforcement agency will decide whether or not they will do a law enforcement certification, which gives that person 
the ability to apply for a U visa. After so many years of having a U visa and uh, under certain conditions, that person can apply for what is commonly called a green card. It's a uh, lawful permanent residence. It's not citizenship, but it's lawful permanent residence, okay. uh, which allows a person to stay in the country and work. Uh, and also you refer to a T visa. It's in a way is a lot similar to a U visa, but it deals specifically for persons who are victims of a severe form of human trafficking, which can be different types of trafficking. It could be sex trafficking, which is commonly what we all tend to think about, but it could also be labor trafficking, which is forced labor, forced work, or work on not under the conditions that a person was promised and that kind of thing. And now that'll do is, uh, it's also an avenue for possible a visa and a possible permanent residence, and then eventually citizenship if that person decides and is eligible for. The human trafficking aspect, and you you kind of you split it up into two subsets, one sexual trafficking and one labor trafficking. I think most of us, we when we think, just when we think about people here from a, from another country to work in these conditions we just we picture migrant workers in fa- on farms on large large scale farms is is that is that mainly what we're talking about or or are we talking about other things as well or what's the breakdown of that that you know of i mean that's definitely a part of it I've worked on cases where a person is promised the world by a broker who uh, says, I'm going to, if you pay me this amount of money, I'm going to facilitate you and perhaps a, a group of other people together. Now, to I don't want to, I don't want to get you to lose your train of thought, but what is a broker? And is that somebody that would be here from the U S or, or more, would it more typically be someone from say their native country that's trying to take advantage of them? It, it could be either. It could be either, or it could be somebody who is familiar with that country because they're from there, but now mm-hmm. they have maybe legalized their status and they're a permanent resident or a citizen now, or it could be someone who's just straight up from here. It would be a person who, who could do that. I mean, it, it could be anybody who, who would do that. So to go back, this broker would make them promises to the, yeah. of a better life than they're really going to have. Exactly. Okay. Uh, and, and so what that can all sometimes entail is the person gets those promises and then they get to the United States and they may not be be put in that line of work that they were promised at all. Uh, sometimes they are get put on what could be called labor camps where the person is forced to work or they're not getting paid as much as they were initially promised. Or sometimes they were promised to work from X date to Y date, but something happens and they might say, oh, we don't have any more work for you. And then also from the sex trafficking perspective, it can be girls and boys who are promised to do different jobs. It could be a lot of different industries. And it could be sexually related legal professions such as, you know, stripping or that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But in reality, what it is, is forced prostitution. It really, a lot of terrible things that the mind could come up with is involved in, in trafficking. And and those are I don't want to I don't want to use the word common here in the United States, but would you say that it is not rare? It's not rare. It's it's very common. Obviously, one instance of it is is too much. It, it is it is in the underbelly of our society in more ways than a lot of us would like to admit. And what are uh, some of those? So, for example, big events, particularly big sporting events like the Super Bowl, is a hotbed for uh, sex trafficking, for example, because there's a lot of traveling ha- happening. There are people coming in from out of town, unsavory people who want to engage in prostitution. Sometimes they're aware that the person is being forced to do it, and sometimes they're not. Sometimes they don't care, of course. But uh, unfortunately, events like that do attract kind of bad stuff. But it, it, I mean, obviously, it could be other things too, other big events, other big things, just Things that tend to draw a lot of crowds, understandably, that's where that kind of stuff is going to be more prevalent. But of course, it, it does happen everywhere, from cities to rural areas, the suburbs, people are traffic, labor traffic, sex traffic. Do, do we do we have an idea? I mean, are, are, are most of the victims of this type of trafficking, are they, say, Latino or Hispanic in nature, Asian? Um, for some reason, I don't really picture it being European, but it may be. Do you do you know the, the kind of the breakup? Well, well, like I, well, like I think I mentioned earlier, you know, I guess 
the news and, and journalists do the best job they can to paint as much of a picture as they can in mm -hmm. three or four minutes. Not just these negative, terrible things that we're talking about, but just in general, people come from all over the place. Even now, of course, a significant portion of people from Central America, people from Asia, the Philippines, India. But also, I think the United States is still an attractive place for many in Europe, for, for people from Africa and just about anywhere else you can think of. We have a term that gets used a lot lately, uh, refugees. Refugees uh, fleeing Syria, refugees fleeing bad situations in Central America or South America. What are some of the protections that we as a, a country offer? So refugee is in some ways the cousin of what I talked about earlier, which is asylum status. A refugee just means somebody who meets the same criteria as someone trying to get asylum status, but they're not presently in this country. They're in another country, and they're making the case that they want to enter this country as a refugee, whereas in a, a person trying to seek asylum is someone who comes in the country first and either goes to the asylum office or gets put into removal proceedings and makes that case. But it's essentially... The same thing there. And so, they, okay, so that's the only difference. An, an asylum seeker is already here, right? And a refugee is trying to get here to seek asylum. Well, to, to seek uh, what is an equivalent type of protection. There are little differences, such as an asylee has the ability after one year of being an asylum status to apply for lawful permanent residence, otherwise known as a green card. Whereas a refugee, if a, if a person enters as a refugee, they are obliged to apply for that green card after a year. But uh, at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's an extremely similar criteria. It's just a matter of geography. Are, are, is the person here or are they still over there? Can you describe to us the difference between lawful permanent residence and naturalized citizen? Okay. So lawful permanent residence is the legal term. Often people still call it a green card. And what it is, it, there's so, there are so many innumerable ways to, to get that through different avenues. But when a person has the lawful permanent residence, that gives them the ability to live permanently in the United States and to work and not be limited in their employment. Uh, but that's that person, that individual who has that is still subject to all of our immigration laws. They can still be removed uh, if they violate certain laws or uh, the cases made that they have. That person is still still subject to another body of law that citizens are not. So citizens are not obviously not subject to the immigration laws. If the only kind of very limited circumstances where uh, a naturalized citizen would be subject to immigration laws is if uh, the federal government determines with evidence that that person was naturalized and became a citizen through some kind of fraud, uh, then a person can, in very limited circumstances, a person can be denaturalized. But if a person becomes a citizen and meets all the requirements that they can essentially do whatever they want, they'll still be subject to our, our domestic criminal laws, but they won't be subject to the immigration laws anymore. So uh, let me duck in and ask me a question real quick. I don't know the term, but when someone is going through the deportation process, say they bit, they're an illegal alien, they've been here for many years, they have American kids, and what... There's some kind of hardship clause that can keep them from being deported, right? Sure. So when a person is in removal proceedings, they're in court, they can make various cases that they're eligible for certain things. Often this, these are things that people aren't aware of on their own. That's where advocates come in and, and represent them or educate them on things that they're eligible for to be able to stay. If a person has been in the United States and they are a lawful permanent resident, maybe they're undocumented, maybe there are other things and they are able to successfully make the case that they have lived in this country for a certain amount of time, a requisite amount of time, and that they have a qualifying United States citizen or lawful permanent resident family member that would experience some bad hardship if that person would have to go back. They could definitely make that case. That that's one avenue of getting lawful status in the United States is, is making that case. That that's only one of the many ways that a person has at their disposal that they may or may not be eligible for. Another common misconception with that is people say, people hear the word hardship, and a lot of times it's natural to assume that the person is making their case that they, that, that that individual in removal proceedings will experience the hardship. I mean, I think it's kind of obvious that that person would not be happy to go back to whatever country they are trying not to be in anymore, but 
the hardship must relate to the qualifying family member. So, what, for example, what a person would do if they represent themselves or, or an advocate on their behalf would make the case that uh, this person is a person of good character. Uh, they've been in the United States for these many years. They, these are witnesses who attest to that. This person is a model person in our society. He or she is very active in the faith community, volunteers on the weekends, never caused any criminal trouble, has never been arrested or, or not, nothing very severe. That those are all things that would be brought up in that kind of context. So it's you show that they're an outstanding citizen, but you it's almost like they're in a Salem. They don't want to go back because of repercussions well, of some sort. You're certainly able to say, don't remove me because I am eligible for asylum and I'm eligible for, we, we call it cancellation or removal, and I'm eligible for other things too. But the person in some country might be completely fine. There might be nothing wrong with it. There might be no reason that the person needs to fear for their life or that they're going to be persecuted. They just simply want to be here with their family. They've been here for so many years. Uh, they've started a life. They started a career, family, and they want to be able to stay with their family, understandably. It might not be anything go going wrong in the home country, but like, again, or they could be, and then they would potentially be eligible for asylum too or something else. And we do hear, and you mentioned it could things could not necessarily be going wrong in their country, but we do hear a good bit of people that are trying to get here from other countries. And now I'm specifically thinking about Central or South America. Aren't there some hotbeds of of gang activity, drug activity, criminal activity, and that people are trying to get here by way of Mexico? from farther south. Isn't that the case? Sure. I mean, th th that's pretty common. Uh, unfortunately, the situation societally and, and governments of Honduras, El Salvador, Guatemala in particular, and other Central American countries, for different reasons, is not a, a good thing. Sometimes transnational gangs and criminal elements exercise significant control over entire towns at times and act as a de facto government. So yeah, it is definitely a serious problem in some of those countries. And that leads to a lot of people being persecuted. Uh, it leads to a lot of people's lives being in danger. So yeah, th that is a lot of people who are from those areas. Sure. You know, they, they come to the United States seeking asylum because of that. Matt, I'm going to ask your opinion on something and it's it's kind of broad, kind of sweeping, but and you may answer it in a way other than I ask it, and that's fine. Um, is it safe to say that the vast majority of people that are trying to come here, and I mean vast majority of people that are trying to get here, are not trying to get here to harm American citizens? Yeah, I, I certainly think that's fair to say, sure. There have been a lot of studies done on this, and I think it's it's pretty clear that the majority of people who come to the United States, either they are afraid or for a legitimate reason, or they're simply just trying to make a better life for themselves. They want what you and I and everybody who are from here wants, which is uh, safety, stability, family, a career, much like our, you know, some of our ancestors who came several hundred years ago, they wanted the same kind of things. And they just want that for themselves and for their families. I mean, you hear a lot in the news, people want to infiltrate the refugee program but in reality, when you hear about things like extreme vetting and that kind of thing, well, in reality, people who are in the refugee program are already very extremely vetted. I mean, mm -hmm. they, are get, they get screened by the Departments of Homeland Security, state, the FBI, uh, national intelligence agencies. It takes 18 to 24 months of checks for a person who is trying to be a refugee and come to the United States. Whereas places like Canada, for example, you only have to go through a four-month process. So I think if if I'm a person who's trying to do harm to the United States, you know, maybe there are ways, people from other countries, there are ways to do that. I, I don't think re the refugee program would be the way that I would go about trying to do that. Right, right. I do want to, I want to go back a few years, and this was, is probably before you were studying this, but you, you may very well have some knowledge of it because it was obviously a landmark watershed event. The people that were here and conducted the terrorist attacks of 9-11. Mm -hmm. What method did they use to get into the U.S.? And they were here legally, is that right? And if they were, what changes have been made since then to make it harder for that to happen? Well, I, I appreciate that you brought that up. My understanding is that the majority of them were in some kind of lawful status 
couple of them were in flight school and either F or J visas, I'm not really sure, to give them the ability to go to those schools Mm -hmm. uh, and get that kind of knowledge. But it's it's really interesting that that comes up because there's a lot of talk about a travel ban, but uh, which includes specifically the countries Iran, Iraq, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and Yemen. But Mm -hmm. interestingly, it doesn't include the countries that the 9-11 hijackers and other people who have come from outside have done us harm. It doesn't include any of their countries. For example, the 9-11 attackers were comprised of 15 of them were Saudi nationals. Mm -hmm. Two of them were from the United Arab Emirates. Mm -hmm. One was from Egypt and one was from from Lebanon. None of the countries that are included on that travel ban. So I know, you know, we might want to get into that later, but I think it's it's appropriate to say that it is it, it does seem a little arbitrary that these are the countries that are going to get singled out when these are not typically the countries where people come from that causes harm. Specifically, what has been put in place since 2001 to more carefully filter? Well, a a lot has changed under the Bush administration when all that happened. What he did was he started the Department of Homeland Security. Prior to that, you had, and you still hear people talk about the INS. There really is no INS anymore. What that was, was the immigration courts, but it was also, it was the judge, it was the prosecutor. What the Bush administration, the second Bush administration had done was separated it into the, so the Department of Justice will oversee the immigration courts and the Department of Homeland Security will serve as the prosecutor in proceedings. So I would think that the thinking behind that is that it would be a more efficient and hopefully a more fair way of adjudicating this, these situations than what we had before when it was just the INS doing everything. Matt, uh, different countries, and we were kind of hitting around the edges of it now, but different countries do get treated differently with regards to immigrants from them. Cuba is an example that stands out. What can you tell us about Cuban refugees or immigrants being treated differently and why? So they are treated differently as of today that we're, we're doing the show. I, I don't know what, what could change in the coming months. I'm not really mm-hmm. sure how much the Trump administration will seek to change what the Obama administration has done as far as opening up lines of communication and ties with Cuba. What we had for a good long while was an expedited legalization status for persons who found a way to get out of Cuba and come to the United States. It's often referred to as the wet foot, dry foot policy. I tend to think that it's not so much a humanitarian thing. This is the reason why our government did that, but rather our government and the Cuban government obviously did not get along. And it was our way of kind of snubbing the Cuban government to say, people want to get out of your country so bad, they want to come here and look at us and we're going to make them, we're going to help them out. So, right. uh, so one thing that opening ties with Cuba does and eliminate that kind of policy or the, or, you know, the state of need for that policy. Matt, with regards to the wet foot, dry foot policy and, and Cuban immigrants or, or uh, refugees, is, has, did that change late in the uh, Obama administration? It, it did. Officially, it ended uh, right before President Obama left office. It ended on the 12th of January of this year, 2017. So it's no longer an existing policy. President Trump may decide to reinstitute it. It's not really clear at this point. It's something of a normalization that was being started by the Obama administration was part of or part of that normalization would be changing this to where refugees or immigrants from Cuba are treated more like just general anybody else anybody else right I see uh, tell you what let's Evan are you okay and Matt are you okay with us taking a quick break and then when we come back I wanted to hit some some things that are more along the headlines right now like the wall the travel ban that now the um, has been struck down in in I guess district courts or appeals courts and the administration wants wants the Supreme Court to hear it and also sanctuary cities I'd like to uh, to hit those topics when we come back
All right, we're back from break. Thank you for staying with us. Again, we are with Matthew Steele. He is immigration law, although he didn't like me using the word expert. I'm going to go ahead and use it anyway. And Matt, some some very hot topics again in the news right now. The travel ban from six Muslim nations, and you touched on it before the break, that they seem to be randomly selected. Uh, some people have even pointed out that the current president doesn't have business interest in those six countries, that it, it may not be that random after all. But you, you did touch on the fact that none of the people that, that have heard us, either in 9-11 or subsequent, you know, much more isolated or minor attacks, none of the people are from those six countries. Yeah, the, it's just – sorry, go ahead. Well, and the courts so far – have said have they've struck this travel ban down can you as those of us that are laymen and and not legally trained or educated can you tell us the basis by which the courts have struck this travel ban down thus far so i i full disclaimer i haven't had an opportunity to read the the opinions of the courts from start to finish i've read certain excerpts and from what i can gather from it is that Essentially, the court is pointing out a couple of things. What it's pointing out is that it's arbitrary that these countries, Iran, Iraq, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and Yemen, there's really no evidence to support that these countries in particular pose any kind of more harm than anybody else. Interestingly, it doesn't include Pakistan. It doesn't include Afghanistan, Egypt, and, and most notably maybe a Saudi Arabia that is by some accounts the largest uh, state sponsor of terrorism in the world. Obviously, we're allies with them. So Interestingly, they're not included, or maybe not interestingly. It's specifically, like I said, the, the 9-11 attackers were Saudis. They were from the United Arab Emirates. They were from Egypt. They were from Lebanon. None of these countries that are included. So I think one of the points that the court is trying to make is that, where did you come up with this? And even internal documents from the federal government have even somewhat admitted that none of these countries pose any kind of more serious harm than any other country or any of these other possible countries that could be considered. As someone that, again, has no legal background but watches the news, I, I don't believe that the president helped it, helped his cause when he, quote, when he ran on, quote, a Muslim travel ban. Sure, sure. Yeah, that, that's, and, that, that's and coming he, back to haunt him for sure. Right. That's, that's really – that. that's something else that the court brings up is, is stuff from the campaign. He – himself called it a Muslim ban. Some of his associates, his advisors, referred to it as a Muslim ban. Maybe most notably Rudy Giuliani, Giuliani has said that Donald Trump had come to him and said, how do we do this legally? How do we do a Muslim ban but do it legally? So it's kind of hard for the Trump administration to now say, well, it has really nothing to do with religion. And then that's another thing that the courts bring up is the Establishment Clause, which relates to the First Amendment. Essentially, what the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment is saying is that you can't have an established state religion. Conversely, there's a, a free exercise clause in the First Amendment also that says that you can't inhibit someone from practicing their religion. But specifically in these cases, the court points to the Establishment Clause and, and says this is essentially at least inching on, this kind of discrimination is, is inching on favoring one religion over another. Exactly. And, that's something that, and that's something that it can't do, or it's not and supposed to do. We are recording this on Saturday, June the 3rd. On just this past Thursday, on June the 1st, the Trump administration petitioned the Supreme Court to review this travel ban. Could you offer up, do, do you think it's fate, or do you have enough to go on even to express, do you think it's fate will be different? Should it be heard by the Supreme Court than it, is, than it has been in the court so far? Well, it is kind of, the timing is kind of curious uh, legally. Because the Supreme Court, they finished this session as far as hearing cases, and they're anticipating going on a three-month break, a summer break. That's not to say that they won't hear it. It's in their discretion, too. It's, there, there's only a very limited types of cases that a person can go to the Supreme Court as a matter of right. Normally, there's a circuit split or there's something where a person or a group or groups will have to file what is called a writ of certiorari, which is essentially asking the Supreme Court to hear a particular case. They may or may not do it. And like I said, all the more now, it seems like it's, it's, it's unclear if they will or not. If they did, it would be strange for several reasons. It would be strange because it's outside of, of the normal Supreme Court session. Mm -hmm. It would likely, it could be heard without oral argument, as far as I know, which would be the norm. It's such a high profile case, and it could be 
almost totally determined outside of the public eye. It's, it's kind of strange. It's going to be interesting to see how it plays out. Also, something in the news of late, Sanctuary Cities. Could you impart a little bit of knowledge on us about what they are, how they work, the purpose they serve, and, and how they seem to be at odds with, I guess it's it's our, uh, attorney, our attorney general and our Department of Justice. If, if that's where, is that where the conflict is, is coming in? Sure. So it's essentially a disagreement often between the federal government and state and local governments as far as is, is it the job of local law enforcement to detain persons for first detain persons for immigration violations, but then to hold people to give federal immigration officials an opportunity to to seize them once they're going to be released, whether it's on a, a criminal bond or whatever. How much cooperation do the local governments and the local police, how much do they have to cooperate with the uh, with the federal government? And the federal government says, OK, you don't want to you don't want to play with us. We'll take away federal funds from your community. So it's kind of a, it's kind of a back and forth between the federal, the state and local governments, you know, from the I think the local governments who support these so-called sanctuary policies from their perspective. We have a system of federalism in this country that. Yes, we're all interrelated, but to what extent? And we have our own sovereignty. We can make our own decisions. We're not here to do your job. You're here to do your job. We're not, we don't have to continue to hold people for you. We're not here to be immigration police. We're here to, for people who are committing crimes and that kind of thing, which I've said earlier, immigration violations are typically not crimes. Is there a constitutional basis for the federal government to withhold any kind of assistance, um, uh, financial or otherwise, from these cities? Well, that, that's something that I think is yet to be determined. I think there's probably compelling arguments on both sides, but I think it's safe to say that it's not something that's completely figured out yet, to what extent that the cooperation needs to be taken place. And if cooperation is refused, it, is the federal government able to really do that, take away federal funds? The news, uh, this is coming from a perspective, as most people I've seen on the news, Jeff Sessions say, we're kind of back off from that idea. So possibly he's starting to concede that they can't really do that. I'm really not sure how that's going to go, but Mm -hmm. that's essentially what the the fight is over from those two perspectives. And one other big topic brought up during the campaign and and is is still thrown out there, although I, I... I think it's it's safe to say that I, I think most of us thought that the wall, the the wall along the Mexican border, the wasn't was never going to be built for a number of reasons. But let's say, for the sake of argument, that it is going to start being built. Let's say, from a standpoint of cost effectiveness, deterrent to bad people, whatever those people might be, bad people getting in, is it, is it something that would be a wise use of our resources and our dollars in terms of making Americans safer? No. Uh, and, and that's not, of course, we all have biases, but I think of this more in an economics realm. Uh, it just, to me, doesn't make fiscally conservative sense to invest all this money when we're in, apparently in trillions of dollars of debt to invest into a wall that I would argue would be completely ineffective. You know, would it deter some? Sure. But people people want to get here, whether for good or bad reasons, they're going to find a way. Uh, I don't think a wall, any kind of wall, uh, I don't think we have the money for it. I don't know how we can justify that we do have the money for it. And even if, for, for argument's sake, if it does get built, as I mentioned earlier, if people would use the refugee program, for example, to come do harm in the United States, if I'm a person who wants to do that and there's a big wall on the United States-Mexico border, okay, well, there's a generally a four-month process to become a refugee in Canada. Mm-hmm. I'm going to go do it that way, and then I'm going to cross that border. So, again, it's kind of another – the Trump administration is trying to make good on campaign promises like every every new president does. But I just don't see, A, how, how we can justify that with everything else that we say that we don't have the money for and – I would say that I don't see any evidence to show that it would be effective at all in in deterring terrorism and, and those kind of things, but also just in general, people crossing the border without permission or without inspection. I just don't see. There, there's a lot of memes online that I think 
are, are funny, but I think they're accurate that in, uh, it, 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 what, what walls are not effective. And then you'll see a bunch of pictures of ladders, you know, right. people, <laughs> I think that, I think the point of that joke is that over under sideways, people would find a way around it. So if we're going to do that again, to be consistent, should we just wall in the entire country? I mean, it all seems a little bit silly to me. It, it, it does. And, and most people that, that get here don't, don't get here just by crossing a physical border on, on foot or on vehicle. And it, right. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Uh, people take planes and you know, there's all kind of ways boat. Speaking of yeah. boat, I think it would be interesting to try to build a wall right down the middle of the Rio Grande river. Okay. I mean, <laughs> write them a letter, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how, how effective that would be either, but mm. go ahead. You know. <laughs> Matt, I, I think that we have all learned a lot during the course of this discussion and again i certainly want to express my appreciation for you taking uh, time out of your busy schedule to join us on this saturday afternoon well likewise i really appreciate y'all having me and taking the time and uh, hopefully we can meet again soon i would i would thoroughly enjoy that yes i would matt like john said that was an amazing episode uh is there you mentioned um what was it ayla yeah, AILA, American Immigration Lawyer Association. And that's if someone's seeking any immigration lawyer help, they can go to this. Just what? Google that. Google that. Go to the website and there, there's a directory. And even if they can't find that, there's contact information. They can contact headquarters and, and they can point them in the direction of somebody. I would say they're, they're typically the best qualified to handle these situations because, like I said, they are the ones who every every morning they get an email of what's changed because immigration is something that uh, changes a lot. And yeah. They st- they, it, it, it helps us stay on top of things. Well, John, let's go ahead and wrap this one up. I think as far as our, our comeback episode, that was just us catching up. And this is our first actual content episode. What do you, what do you think about it, John? That was a good one to come back on. That was a great one to come back on. I, I know that there's a lot of interest in this topic. I have f- floated the uh, topic by some friends and listeners. Uh, actually, the, the question about TV uh, visas and U visas was a listener submitted question. So I know there's a lot of interest out there. This is timely. This is topical. I'm, I'm thrilled with it. And I think that we will uh, get a lot of good feedback on it. I enjoyed that episode. I, I know I did too. that was a great one to come back with. John, do you have anything else, my man? No, that's it. Again, thanks to Matthew Steele. Thank you to our listeners, and uh, thanks for staying with us. You know we love you guys, and we will talk to you next time. Love you all. See you.